it wasn't our perspective to think we're going to make it. Like, you know, like people, when people ask you, like, how do you make it? <laughs> it's like, you make something and you just don't ask me that dumb question. <laughs> Certainly, we weren't thinking this is going to be the one. This is going to be the one. Every time we put out a record, it was it was exciting because, as I said, there there, there was there was growth. Um, it was shocking, and we were very very lucky to on our sixth record, sixth after being a band for twelve twelve years. Mm -hmm. Twelve years after being a band for twelve years to suddenly have the mainstream go. Oh, we like this. That's pretty rare. I wonder how many bands yeah. have their like mainstream breakout after 12 years. The scene that we came from and just our mentalities in general, there was never a fixation on success. We were successful every step of the way because either we were making 500 copies of a seven inch record that was like wildly exciting, or we were playing the smallest show in the world, which was, you know, seemed exciting as well, or going on tour. So it's like we, we had this sense of accomplishment and success every step of the way. So, um, you know, when finally some sort of mainstream attention was being directed towards us, it was, it was exciting, but it was, um, you know, it was never really something that we were actively seeking. Last record written in the squat, the final squat record. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's where, that's where we wrote that one. <laughs> so we got to move out of the squat. That was the real indication that we'd hit the big time. Although none of us did for a long time, right? Didn't didn't we stay there through? Uh, no, I was the last to move out. I think I moved to a shabby apartment down the street, but it was still my <laughs> own place. I had a, my own bathroom. You know, there wasn't mold or like rats or cockroaches or anything like that. Sing Sorrow was really really exciting f for us to make. The, the first thing I remember about making Sing the Sorrow that was most exciting to me was I believe it was the first record that I was going to be able to have time to track the vocals in a period that wouldn't absolutely result in me destroying my voice. A sustainable fashion. Yeah, in a sustainable fashion, because up until then, we wouldn't be able to afford to track in a way that didn't result in me doing all of the vocals at the very end, and historically, typically, in a matter of one or two days, um, which you'll hear those performances on those records when you, um, when you listen to them. So it was really exciting in, in that regard once we finally got to the stage of, of recording the record. We signed to DreamWorks, our first major label, first real producers, um, Butch Vig and Jerry Finn. Remember when we met Butch for the first time, he was suffering from Bell's palsy, which is this weird thing that they don't really know what causes it, but it causes like half your face to be paralyzed. Oh yeah. And so we're like, whoa, you know, it felt really bad for him. We're like, are you <laughs> sure yeah. you want to be here working you don't right have now? He's like, oh, it's, it's fine. And he's like the coolest dude, super nice. Butch is and, great, um, good sweaters. Yeah. Butch would bring us cookies. It was a drag. Now Butch was Butch would was only there for a couple weeks, right? The entire Sing of Sorrow process was months and months and months of tracking. He was there at the end. He was there at the beginning yeah. and end. Yeah, it was. He there had at to the go on tour with again. Garbage at yeah. some point while we we're making the record. Yeah, and so it was he, he and Jerry who were producing it. Yeah, and so Jerry was there the whole time. And when Butch was there, he would bring Uncle Eddie's cookies, and I would eat them all. And that was um, what you remember him for. And yeah, and I thank you for that, Butch. Um, they were delicious. We got to make it in a studio that you know where they made pet sounds, and it was like a very storied studio and mm -hmm. named Ch called Cello. And um, everything about it just seemed bigger, with bigger budgets, bigger label, bigger everything. And being the first time we had real videos with real budgets mm -hmm. and MTV and real radio play, and you know. That was like number five. I think we debuted at like number five on Billboard. Oh. So it was like all these things that we had never experienced that yeah. were really made us feel like that was a commercial breakthrough. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was really exciting for us at the time to really have those opportunities too, because we there were, there was music that we wanted to make, but we just didn't have the resources to do it. I started programming electronic music somewhere like around ninety nine two thousand, and then I thought, well, let me bring some of this into AFI and have this other element to it. So some of that stuff came in there. And I remember like the intro track of, of that record is, has all this programming. And I remember, I, you know, I worked on a computer, so I, I brought in 
this session for Jerry and Butch. And I'm like, here, I got the intro, like, check it out. And there was 120 tracks. And they're like, what are you doing? Like, you can't do this. This is like, I'm like, this is normal, 120 tracks, right? <laughs> I made it. Yeah, so yeah. that was a stylistic change, I guess, on that record.